What I'm going to be talking about today is Spring Cloud. And obviously, as uh, we could just see with the show of hands, a lot of you will have already seen Josh's talk. And I was actually counting on that. And you can also imagine probably that it's a little bit challenging to follow up Josh Long to talk a little bit more about Spring Cloud after what you've seen already. So um, what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to very quickly uh, cover the idea of Spring Cloud, but then I'm actually going to dive into some details on how some of the stuff that you've just seen demoed, how it actually works, why it works that way, and how you could apply it to your own projects. So in essence, when you're talking about Spring Cloud, what it is, it's really a set of projects. It's not a single project. It's a whole collection. And actually, it's only becoming more and more with every major release train uh, that will help you to build distributed systems. And this can be distributed systems of any sort and any type of nature, right? Obviously, lots of people will be using this and thinking about this in terms of microservices, and that's definitely one of the more obvious use cases. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be something that necessarily runs in a cloud, for example, despite the name Spring Cloud. Um, it, you even have new terms coming up, like the guys from InnoQ calling things like self-contained uh, self systems. Um, Th those are all use cases where you could use some of the stuff uh, like Spring Cloud. Even if you have a big fat monolith sitting inside of your organization, but it's calling out to external systems right over the internet. Maybe you're partnering with other organizations and you need to consume some of their RESTful services, for example. You can use Spring Cloud for systems like that. So what do I want to cover today? Well, for those of you who did not attend um, Josh's talk, um, basically, my agenda is thinking as a service, as a Spring Cloud application. Uh, I'm going to answer three questions. Um, so from a services point of view, the first question I will, I will answer is, who am I? Right? Service wakes up, it's being bootstrapped, bootstrapped, and it needs to know who it is. Uh, th that may sound a bit weird, who am I? But what I mostly mean is, who am I this time? Because you can have the same service running in very different configurations. You might have multiple instances of it running in the same environment. You might actually have it running over different environments. You may have it running locally on your laptop because you're developing. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you can find that out and how you can then do different things depending on who you are. And the next thing it needs to know, since it's a connected service, right? We're talking about distributed systems, is where are all the other services? What services are there? Where can I find them? How can I talk to them, basically? Right? So that's the last point. How do I talk to them? Uh, there are multiple ways, typically, in a distributed application to have services communicate with each other. Um, two primary ways are sync and async. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those things. For those of you that did see Josh's talk, I made a separate agenda, actually. Basically, I'm going to talk about what the hell just happened. right? This is a guy who's going really fast, showing you everything there is in the kitchen sink called Spring Cloud, but by, uh, by intent, not explaining a lot about it. So hopefully after this talk, if you were there as well, you'll understand a little bit more uh, about how this stuff actually works. Right. So to start with that first question that I posed, like, who am I this time? What we're really talking about here is centralized configuration. Right. Every application. Uh, being it a microservice or not, or being a big monolith, needs some form of configuration at startup. And if you've been working with Spring for a while, then probably uh, the traditional way that you've been doing is, is through something like a properties file uh, that you uh, put maybe on your class path or next to your application somewhere on the file system and you read it from there. Um, when we're talking about distributed systems and we're talking about multiple instances of applications running, then actually, uh, in many cases, um, you will Let's try that again. Um, in many cases, what you will want is you will want to take that configuration away from just the local file system of a single service, for example, and you will want to put it somewhere centrally. So this is uh, for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is that if you have something like 10 different instances, just for availability reasons, of your service, 
you don't really want to copy over the same configuration file to 10 different servers to make sure that when your application starts up, it can actually find the correct configuration for that particular environment that it's running in. Another thing is that configuration may not actually be specific to a single application. You might have some shared configuration for a number of reasons. Um, simple example, even though uh, it's best practice to have microservices use, uh, have their own database, that may not actually mean that they're all going to have their own DBMS instance running, right? Companies typically spend a lot of money on buying good hardware with lots of fast disks and lots of memory to run their databases. So you probably just want to have a dedicated schema in there. So you're going to end up, uh, in case you have a lot of data-heavy services, with lots of applications that need to connect to your database. Now, I've actually had the case in one of the applications that I'm working on where we don't have this stuff in place yet, um, where our hosting company said, well, you know, we made you happy, and rather than having the old boxes in there for MySQL, we're running a, an active, active setup of MySQL there, uh, we have replaced the whole thing with uh, bare metal boxes, uh, very fast, uh, lots of RAM, and this is new IP addresses. And what I had to do, I had to log in in like a dozen services, and I think I changed over two dozen configuration files for all of the various applications, cron jobs, scripts, uh, things that we had running that needed to somehow connect to the database. Right? So it makes a lot of sense for all of those cases to say, well, let's just put that in a single place, and when it changes, we can let everyone know. Um, so um, the same thing obviously is true for running in different environments, right? On an acceptance environment or when you're running locally on your machine, you're probably going to have some different requirements uh, than you have when you're running in production. You might even have services running through a special Spring profile, for example, where you want dedicated configuration there. And finally, if your configuration does change, then what are you going to do? Typically, if you're using something like a properties file with Spring, uh, it actually you're forced to just restart the whole application when configuration changes. So that would mean that even if you have central configuration, but only that, that you would still need to know, okay, I changed this one configuration key. Now I have to know which applications are actually relying on that key, and I have to find those instances, and I have to manually restart them. So it would also be nice to be able to push out configuration updates back to the services. Right? So, Spring Cloud has support for this, and they have support in two ways. They actually provide a product uh, that you can use as a centralized configuration server. This is called Spring Cloud Config Server, and Josh briefly demoed it in his previous talk. Um, but they also have an abstraction for clients that connect to such a configuration service. And Spring Cloud Config Server is not the only service that is supported. Uh, there are a couple of other ones, actually. So um, I'll be demoing if, uh, if it actually works, because like I said, my computer just crashed. I have no idea what is still on my file system and what isn't, so we'll have a look. Uh, but I'm going to demo that through another product of a company called HashiCorp um, called Console. Right? They make a number of free tools that are very popular in the cloud and services space. Um, so to first start with that console, um, I'm just going to start it up locally here. Um, this thing can actually be uh, configured to expose a user interface. And that's going to start up right now. There we go. It's a bit too small, so it's switching to mobile view. There we go. Um, so what you see here is an overview. I have some services, but actually my services are not running yet, so that's why you see a bunch of orange things here, but I'll talk about that later on. But here we actually have key value pairs. Um, this is literally key value pairs that you can simply store inside of console and that you can then expose. So what do I have here? I have a, like a directory uh, called config, and under that I have a bunch of subdirectories um, corresponding to a number of applications that I have. Plus one extra that is simply called application, which is for configuration that applies to all services. Right, so if we have a look here at application, you can, for example, see that I have a key configured called a logging.pattern.console where, where I'm changing the uh, default logging pattern that is, uh, that is used by Spring Boot for producing its logging output when it's writing to the console. Um, also, for 
a service that I'm about to start, uh, I've actually changed the default log level. You can do these sort of things with Spring Boot quite easily. Yeah, but I don't should be it, right? Okay, um, so that's the server side of things. This is where we can put our configuration. Now, how do we actually access this from an application? Now, I thought about doing some live coding. Actually, and now I'm really glad that I didn't do that. But in any ways, following up on Josh Long, live coding is not going to be impressive anyways. So I have some code set up here. Um, I have a service that will expose uh, conference talks, right? Because we're in a conference and uh, we actually have some internal applications that do these sort of things. So what I have here is a simple Spring Boot application. Um, and the application um, basically just uh, shows a number of talks from this particular track exposed as RESTful resources, right? There's a simple controller for that doing that. I'm not going to go over the entire code because it's not actually all that interesting. Um, the thing that's interesting, first of all, is when we go to the Maven Palm here and look at the dependencies that this thing has. Now, apart from just a regular boot uh, configuration, you can see this thing, Spring Cloud Starter Console All. This means I want all of the console support provided by Spring Cloud. So what is that? Well, if I click through on that, you can see it's actually two things. It's Spring Cloud Starter Console uh, Config and Starter Console Discovery. So this thing is about the config part. Simply by putting this on my class path at startup, it will discover that we need to connect to a console server for configuration purposes. Question is, how does it know how to connect to console, right? It cannot actually get the configuration from that from console. This is a bootstrap problem. And um, as Josh actually uh, showed already during his talk, uh, there is a mechanism for this in Spring Cloud where next to an application properties file, you can actually have a bootstrap properties file. Uh, typically, you configure this with two things. You configure a name for the application so that it knows, for example, what to ask for from the configuration server. And you configure it with the actual location of the configuration service. Now, in a cloud environment of, of sorts, you would probably get this from an environment variable. So that's why you have the config server URL there. That could come from a system property or an environment variable. But I'm having a fallback here as a default, which is just uh, the console running here on localhost. So um, what I'm going to do over here is uh, I'm going to uh, start the application uh, like this. Now, the reason I'm doing it here from the uh, command line is that later on, I want to actually have a second instance running next to it in two consoles. And I want to sh show you some output of that. Um, hopefully, what this will do is uh, it at startup, it will find the uh, Bootstrap Properties configuration, it will connect to console, uh, it will then find its configuration, and then using that configuration, it will bootstrap the rest of the Spring application. So let's make it a bit bigger. Here we go. So the first thing that's happening is uh, it's just uh, uh, using Maven to start up the application. I'll make this a bit bigger. Uh, this is bigger, yes. Thank you very much. So we see a number of things happening here. I'm sorry, yeah, it's responding really slowly. So when I'm thinking I'm making it bigger, it's actually becoming smaller. There we go. That's better. Um, we see a number of th interesting things here happening. There is a custom boot logo here. I, I didn't just put that in because it looks so nice. I, I'm actually putting that in to make a point later on. Um, and then we see it starting up. Um, if you look very carefully, you can actually see that the logging is in, uh, has changed. Uh, there is no date in front. There is only uh, the time stamp here. And that is because it's getting its logging pattern from this remote configuration server. So, OK, you have to believe me now that this works. So how would you actually know this, right? What, what is actually happening here when we do this? So one of the things that you can do with Spring Boot application is you can expose these actuator endpoints. And this thing is exposing an environment actuator endpoint that will actually show uh, all of the uh, settings that it has. Oh, I missed an eight there. I'm sorry. So um, closing some of this here. What you can see here is that we actually have different uh, 
uh, configuration sets here. These things are called property sources in Spring. So at the top, we can see that uh, I have some local configuration for my server port. That's actually coming from uh, my, uh, my application.properties file. Then you can see there is a console-based config slash talk service one that sets my debug level. Um, then you see there is another one, config application, uh, to override that uh, logging pattern. Um, then there are also the configurations that uh, the application can read from the system properties, Java system properties, as well as the environment. And then finally, you see some local uh, uh, data sources as well. So these things are ordered, actually. So this will tell you exactly what configuration your application is using, first of all, but also where it's getting it from. Right? So that's an, an, an important concept. Now, another thing that's interesting, um, I had a browser tab open for that, but obviously everything crashed, so I'm just going to tell you. Uh, I talked about um, refreshing and pushing out updates, right? If you were now to look at the latest documentation of Spring Cloud and you check out the console support, it actually says console has a really nice hook that you can use to be informed about configuration updates, but unfortunately we don't support it yet. This will come in a future version. Now you may have heard the expression of um, uh, under promise and over deliver. Uh, that seems to be exactly what they did when they wrote this documentation. It does actually work. Um, so let me quickly show you that. If I go over here and I change this log level here, for example, to info, and I update, I can go here. And actually, when I scroll down a bit here, then what you can see here uh, maybe a bit hard to read, but I'll, I'll just tell you here, is an application context is being closed and started again, and we see refresh keys changed, logging.level.talk. So this application does know that the configuration changed, and it's reconfiguring itself. Now, the final thing I wanted to explain in, in a little bit more detail here is how does this even work, right? Because if you are used to Spring applications, but you haven't worked with this, then you probably know that typically when, you, when you've read something like a properties file at startup, that's it, right? These things are just cached in memory and the, the only thing you can do to refresh a configuration is to just restart the entire application. So they use a little trick for this. Um, and that's also why you have the dedicated bootstrap.properties file. Basically what will happen with a Spring Cloud-based application is when you start it up, it creates a separate application context. So it's like a, a little Spring application inside of your application. And this thing is only responsible for uh, basically going out to the configuration server, getting all of that configuration and creating custom property sources. And when that's done, your usual Spring Boot application starts up with its own application context which has a reference to this cloud-based root context. And when stuff changes, like you're seeing here, that, that ultimate cloud-based application context is being recreated. So it's not the entire application that's being restarted. It's only that part of the application context. In addition to that, but Josh already showed that, so I'm not going to do it again, you can annotate your beans with at refresh scope, and you can actually have objects in your application being restarted as well if they rely on certain configuration properties that you would like to be able to change at runtime. Now, there's some other stuff you can do um, for demo purposes like this. It's actually nice to have individual key value pairs in console. If you have really big applications that take like 50 properties, that's not really going to scale. So you can actually tell this thing, I just want to have a single key value pair for every application where the value is just going to be the contents of a properties file or a YAML file, right? Those things are fully supported. You can even have your configuration in Git and run a, a script called Git to console that will actually export all of that configuration and load it up into console, which I think makes perfect sense, right? Because configuration is definitely something you will want to put in version control. So even though I'm not actually showing it, these things are fully supported. So. That's the configuration part then. So that's nice. Now we can start up. We know who we are. Where are the other ones? And for those of you that were at Joseph's talk, uh, you've probably seen already that uh, Spring Cloud supports the notion of a service registry. 
So what's the idea there with the service registry? Well, uh, obviously, when you're actually building a distributed system, uh, it's distributed because these things are not islands by themselves, right? They need to communicate with each other. So uh, the first thing a service needs to do when it starts up and it has its configuration, it needs to advertise its presence. It needs to tell the world, hey, I'm here. This is my name. This is where you can find me. Um, and even things like, this is where you can check if I'm doing OK. Then obviously, as a client, it also needs to find out where all of the other services are that it wants to connect with. Now, you may use something like DNS for that. And for a particular certain use case, that actually works really well. Right? I don't really have to know where other services are. I just need to know their logical DNS name. And there will be something that then provides me with uh, an actual IP address and, and stuff like that. But there are a lot of use cases for which that doesn't really work. Um, one obvious use case, and again, just mentioned this in passing, is that uh, when you're um, finding out that there are multiple instances of a single service and you want to talk with one of them, you may want to choose which instance you're talking to yourself, rather than leaving that up to some middleware-based load balancer that you have absolutely zero control over. Netflix actually uses this, for example, to find out which of the service instances uh, that are reachable are um, the fastest to talk to, which have the lowest latency. A load balancer doesn't know that because a load balancer doesn't talk to the service itself. It's your client who is talking to a service. And there may be all sorts of things happening, especially in cloud-based environments, that cause that to be slower or faster. So if you can actually measure how fast you can connect to a service, then you are in the best position to actually make that choice. Right, so in that case, you need a complete overview of all of the services that are there. Um, from an operations point of view also, it's important to have an overview of what services are actually there, and are those the services that we expect to be there, or is there stuff missing? And if a service is there, how do we actually check that it's running successfully, that it's completely operational, that it can talk to its middleware, like its database, like its message broker, that sort of thing. So that's health checking, basically. And with a service registry, Whenever a service registers itself, it can actually talk to the service registry and say, oh, by the way, this is how you can check if I'm doing OK. Right? So that's, that's handy. Now, Netflix has actually open sourced their service registry, which is called Eureka. Um, just demoed it, so I'm not going to do that again. But uh, if you want to run Eureka, the most convenient way to do that is through a special starter that uh, Spring Cloud provides. And then you can just run it as a Spring Boot application, basically. Obviously, sh you should be running these things uh, with multiple instances because it needs to be highly available. But the, um, the console product I just uh, demoed uh, is actually also a service registry. So you can have both your configuration and your services in a single place. So to have a quick look at that, um, if I currently go here, I can actually see already that uh, I have uh, an overview here. Uh, but some things seem to be not so okay. Now that is because this thing is actually remembering what services were running before it shut down. Now everything shut down in, let's say, a not so very clean way just now on my computer. So it says I have these services, they, they said that they would be here, they've never officially said to me that I'm going away, uh, but they're not there. So I'm getting failures which in this case is, is a good thing, right? I know that certain services are not running. And you can see that here. I'm actually supposed to have two instances of this particular service running. Here, what you can see is one of the services that is running. Why is that not working? Here we go. One of the services that's running is uh, on port 8081. Let's skip that. Uh, and that's okay, that's green. But the other one uh, on port 8882 is currently failing. Now, let me fix that for you. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start up another instance, but I'm going to say uh, server.port equals 8.8.2, and then say Spring Boot run. And in my IDE, in the same time, I'm going to start up some other services. Because what I've been doing is I've, I've wrote a very small sample application. By the way, I'll put a URL to the source code on Twitter after the talk, so you can download the code as well. Um, that will simply bootstrap uh, a number of services. That's one, and that's one. There we go. It's a bit sluggish, but it will be there in a second. 
Now, while it's doing that, um, going back here. You can see this one's still failing. Uh, yeah, it should be up in a moment. Let's see if this is going okay. Yep, that's working fine. This is running. Yeah, it's just a bit slow. So just to get ahead of myself a little bit and make the demo go a bit more fluent, um, I said that uh, these services can register health check endpoint. So that's how console actually knows if my service is there. It's going to talk to an endpoint. Um, I can show you for my endpoint that's already up and running what that looks like. So that's the slash health endpoint by default. And this is provided by Spring Boot. Right? So what you see here is that, first of all, my service is actually saying I'm up. That's the key thing here. The service itself is expressing the fact that it's up and sending back a 200 OK with this JSON response. Uh, but it's also showing you some of the things it did to check that. So it's not just saying I'm here. It's actually checking some of its own dependencies as well. So it's, it has automatically received a database check because I'm using an in-memory database. Um, uh, it, it actually is going to check if it can talk to console, right? Because this is, if this is a client to your service registry, well, it, it better be able to talk to that service registry. Um, it better have disk space left running on the device that you're on, right? So those are some of the checks, as you can see here, uh, that are automatically provided there. Now, that seems to be going in the right direction. So in the meantime, let me check if my demo application is already up and running there. No, not yet. Well, it will be there in a second. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more of that service registry in a moment. In the meantime, um, let's talk a little bit more about what happens when we are actually registered and now we want to talk to some other services, right? Now, uh, in general, this is not specific to services or cloud or anything. Um, there's two ways to modes of interaction when it comes to um, talking to, to other pieces of software running somewhere. You can do it synchronously. Right? This is typically something you would do over HTTP, for example. You make a request. You wait for a response to come back. Or uh, you can do it asynchronously. And this is typically done through messaging. Right? I'm going to send the message. And as soon as the message has reached some centralized message broker, I'm done. I don't have to wait anymore. Some other service, and this could be a single service, but it, it could be a whole bunch of services, can then process that message. Maybe they want to produce a response, but that's okay. If they want to, they can send me a response back, but they will again do that on some queue, and eventually I'll just pick up that message from some other queue. And both are typically very important in, in an application architecture to have. So synchronous, like blocking communication, is, is often done for things like queries, right? If I want to check a, a database, uh, I'm expecting a result now. I, I don't say, I would like you to figure that out, and uh, maybe just uh, later on you'll c get back to me with the results. No, I actually have a user waiting for this result, so I'm going to call it uh, immediately, synchronously. Uh, other things like uh, sending maybe a command to a, a service saying, I want you to do something, but I, I'm willing to wait on the result because the result is very important for me. I need to process that somehow. Right? Now, some concerns that come into play when you're doing this is, are you going to just do a blocking call? Which is, uh, in Java at least, is, is the most obvious thing to do typically. Right? You're just going to block your thread to make an HTTP request, for example, and nothing will happen until uh, that has either worked out or has timed out. Um, nowadays, uh, there are, is a lot of effort in actually making these sort of things non-blocking. So that's the whole reactive thing. Now, you can say whatever you like about reactive, and it's a very important thing, but it's still obviously synchronous communication, right? Don't think that all of a sudden doing non-blocking communication makes it asynchronous. Those are two very different things. Um, some things that come into play, as I said already, are things like load balancing, right? If I'm calling out to some service instance, which one is it going to be? And if that thing goes down and another one goes up, how do I make sure that I actually route my request to this other instance? Uh, the other thing, uh, and this is typically uh, where uh, uh, the whole robustness uh, or rugged thing comes in, is that I want to make sure that when I call something and something is wrong, then I'm not going to be affected as an application myself. right? So there's a number of things there that are important. Obviously, things like timeouts. Right? If you're going to connect to some external service, don't wait forever for the connection to come there. 
If you have a connection and you actually make the request, don't block forever until uh, some response comes back over the socket, right? You need timeouts for all of these things. Um, and, and in many cases, it's actually much worse if a service that you're talking to just responds really slowly rather than is simply completely unavailable because you will find that out immediately, right? I'm going to try to connect and immediately. I'm going to get an I.O. exception. There is no socket there. But it's much, much worse if it, if it actually does respond, but it simply takes minutes rather than hours. Uh, also, if something goes wrong then, I cannot simply fail, right? I need to have some kind of way of falling back. Uh, and I also need to make sure that I don't, I don't overload other services. Maybe if for whatever reason my service all of a sudden comes under a really high load, I don't simply want to push all of that load out to the rest of the system and then maybe kill everyone in the process, right? I need some way to throttle that. So those are some things that come into play with synchronous uh, inter-service calls. And the interesting thing is that uh, Netflix has open sourced another library of theirs called Hystrix that will actually allow you to do a lot of these things that I just mentioned. So I want to show you a little bit about that. Some other things that they have open source that are very much used in tandem with this are uh, something called Ribbon. This is a client-side load balancer. Right? So this is a thing where you can say, I would like to make a request to a service. You figure out what service instance. And it can do just trivial round-robin load balancing, which if the demo gods will allow me to, I will actually show you in a moment. Uh, but you can do fancier things as well, like for example, the example I mentioned where you're doing, um, you're doing routing based on measured latency and that's those kind of things, right? It could be uh, particular tags that are being set on requests as well. There's all sorts of options there. And finally, uh, but I'm not gonna show you this because Joss did that already, there is Zool, which is uh, a proxy-based approach that allows you to say, I have a bunch of backend services, and I'd like to expose them through a single HTTP endpoint, right? And that single HTTP endpoint may have some additional uh, things on top, like security requirements. But after that, it's just going to propagate my requests to those uh, backing services. So what I'm going to show you in Hystrix, first of all, is something called a circuit breaker. Circuit breaker is a uh, pattern that says, if I find out that some service that I'm talking to is not there, or it's not responding properly, I'm not going to just keep on trying. I'm going to give up after a while. I'm going to remember the fact that this service was not there. And then for a configurable period of time, I will simply not try. I will immediately fail if someone tries to call the service and say, sorry, the service is currently not there. And then after a while, I will try again. I will try once. And then if that request actually works out, I say, OK, we're back. But if it doesn't, then immediately it's just going to remember that uh, this is not going anywhere. Um, let me first check if things have loaded already. Oops. No, it simply hasn't started yet. That's OK, then. So what I've done in the meantime, uh, let me just quickly explain the setup here. We have two instances of a talk service. We have one instance of a review service that will allow me to find out if there are any reviews for particular talks that we have in the system. And I have a single web application in front of those two or three services. Um, the web application uh, will need to talk to both services, and it's going to do that in a synchronous manner. Um, for example, wow, things are really, really slow here. Yeah, there we go. So what I have here is um, a service in the web application, right? So this thing is part of my web application. And um, it has a method here called all talks that simply returns all of the talks that are uh, available in the system for this particular conference or this particular track. Um, and it does that by using a REST template here that says get me that URL there and it's talking to slash talk service. Now that's not a DNS name, that's a service name. So what this thing will do at startup is it's going to connect to my console and when everything is up and running, it should show up here. But I seem to be having some issues here. So let's see if this actually works. Yep, 
Here we go. So first request actually fails, as you can see here now. I, I get a page, so my web app works, but there's nothing there. So what happened here? Well, apparently, this method got called, but there was a problem talking to that backing talk service. Notice that there is an add hysterics command annotation here with a fallback attribute. So what's that saying is that if you somehow fail to successfully complete this method execution, there is some exception, just call the cached talks method instead. And this method can have any visibility, but apart from that, it needs to have the same method signature as the original method. And that one is just going to return a cached version of all of the talks. But since I've never made a successful request yet, my cache is empty, so I'm not actually seeing anything. Now, it does worry me a little bit, obviously, that I'm not seeing anything. So hopefully that was just part of the slowness. Yes, here we go. So now you see that it's doing another attempt and it's seeing, okay, stuff is back up. I can now call these services. Uh, and I can click through and I can, for example, find out some information about Josh's talk. And it's actually interesting. He has the way longest uh, presentation uh, summary of, of all of the speakers in this track. That's probably because he talks so fast. Right. So this is my application now. Uh, the thing I wanted to really show you, because that was the demo I had prepared, is this. If you look here at the bottom, you can see my two instances of the same talk service running, right? One on port 8881, one on port 8882. Now, if console has successfully picked up on the fact that these things are both running, which I'm having some doubts about, but we'll see, then what we should be seeing now is automatic load balancing by ribbon. So I'm making a first request, and that was on the right. It says returning all talks. It just popped up. I'm doing another. Oh, that was on the left. I'm doing another on the right, on the left, on the right, on the left, right? So this is ribbon in action. So this is a combination of making sure that we have a service registry in place, that we have hysterics in place, and that we have ribbon in place. And it's simply a matter of putting this stuff on the class path, putting an add enable annotation in there. And this is the behavior that you get. Now, if I now kill a service, boom, and I make another re request here, then this first request is already done, but I'm not actually seeing anything there. Now, this one goes there. Oh, nothing. Oh, there again. Boom, nothing. So it doesn't know yet that this other service is no longer there. It will find out very quickly, and that then it's just routing all of the requests to the thing on the left. But if you actually look at the output of my web application now, here, then what you will see is that there are actually some exceptions here because it was trying to connect to a service that I simply killed, but we didn't see any errors or exceptions in the web application. That's because if you're looking at some of the output here, you can see that sometimes it says talk service unavailable, I'm returning the cache talks, right? So that's the circuit breaker in action there. Now, going back to this, uh, many people think of circuit breakers as the main feature of, of Hysterix, right? This is the thing that everyone demos. Um, this is from a guy called Ben Christensen. He used to be one of the chief architects at Netflix, and he was responsible for a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you here today. Uh, he's currently working at Facebook. But um, he has said in the past that actually circuit breakers are highly overrated. We could drop it from Hysterix, hardly miss it. The most important thing is actually concurrency limits or bulk heading. Right? So this is another feature. And it's something that not many people, I think, talk about. So I thought it would be interesting to show you at least a little bit of it. A bulkhead is something they use in ships to protect it from sinking if there is a leak. So if there is a leak in this ship, only one compartment will actually flood with water. But the rest of the compartments will stay filled with air and the ship will stay afloat. That's the whole idea. So how does this translate into uh, software? Well, let me show you something. I'll just keep this instance down. That's fine for now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some requests to my application that's currently still running, but I'm going to do it using a little test generation tool from Apache Benchmark. So I'm going to say do a 1,000 requests, do 10 concurrent requests, and I want to make them to localhost 8080. Now, this should work fine, right? Everything is running. You can see lots of outputs from my controller returning all of these talks. And then in a moment's time, this thing will say, oh, yeah, I've just done a 1,000 requests. It was all A-OK. -okay. How can we see this? Well, uh, there's actually an application that exposes my circuit breaker state. Um, so here we have failed requests zero on the right. Uh, so everything works as expected. It's not terribly exciting, actually. 
But I want to show you something else. Now, while this thing is starting up, let's see what happens if we try the same thing again as we just did. So doing a thousand requests, but this time we're going to increase the concurrency level to 15 rather than 10. There it goes, spawning away. Almost done. And now on that side, everything looks okay, right? Because every request that actually makes it to my talk service is, is handled just fine, that's okay. But now on the right, if this thing completes in a, in a moment's time, you will see that it actually got a lot of errors. Now that's interesting because it's getting errors. My service is running. Um, I have Hysterix configured. I have a fallback. Uh, but still, in this case, uh, let's see where are the errors. Complete a thousand requests. Yeah, there were 115 failed requests. So that's, that's not even like... A, some requests, right? That's a very significant portion of requests completely failing and not going through the fallback. So what's happening here? Well, it turns out that if you're using Hysterix, you're actually getting a second feature, and it's a feature, <laughs> but you have to know about it, otherwise it's a bug. Um, and what this thing is going to do is it's going to limit the amount of concurrent requests that you are allowed to make to any service guarded by a circuit breaker, right? Um, you can see that here, this is the Hysterix dashboard. On the t I can see my circuit breakers here, so my old talks, for example. But I can also see the threat pools below that. And this is actually the bulk heading in action. Now, um, oh, actually, I can see that I already increased the pool size somewhat. But still, this thing has a fixed pool size. And this is to prevent you from overloading other services. And the default, actually, in Hysterix is only 10. You get a thread pool of 10 threads. And you can never make more than 10 threads at the same time to some service. And if you are trying to make another request, while well, those 10 requests are already in action, it's just going to fail completely, immediately. And it's not even going to go through your fallback. Because the idea is, you're being overloaded. You need to tell whatever client you have that you're simply not available because the system is too busy. This prevents the whole system from actually going down and being overloaded. But if you don't know about this, it's very easy to say, um, I, have, uh, I have configured everything. I think I can go to production. And then before you know it, you're doing a denial of service on yourself because you're only allowing yourself to make 10 requests to all of your backing services at the same time. Right? So to configure this stuff, and that's really what I wanted to show you uh, in my talk service here, you can do things like configure the size of this thread pool. So I see that here. You can see I have set the thread pool properties here. I set the core size to 20. Now, even that's not enough, right? If I'm using a tool that I, like a load balancing tool I was just using, even saying 15, those requests come in so fast that even uh, a thread pool of 20 here is not even enough. Uh, but this is something to be aware of. And you can see the thing going down if I do it again. If we now go to this dashboard here, you can see it, it looks fine for a while, but then boom, everything goes red. And um, you can see that the thread pool, um, a lot of the threads are becoming active. It's starting to queue up things. And after a while, things just go haywire. Then they go back down again, right? The requests are, ma are made. You can actually make a thousand requests really quick if you just let them fail immediately, as it turns out. Um, but this is very much something to be aware of. It's an important feature, but if you, if you don't know about the feature, things will just break. Now, finally, um, there's also async messaging um, through uh, or support for async messaging. And this is typically used for things like broadcasting events, right? If something happened in your application and you would like other applications to know, you don't need to tell them one by one explicitly that something happened. What you would like to do is just broadcast a message, and that's particularly suitable for message brokers. Also, request responses where you don't actually have to block and wait for the response because there is no user performing an ACP request, for example, that you need the result for. You can just send a request and then whenever the response comes back, you say, okay, thanks for the response, I'll just process it. It's perfect for async. Now, there's a lot of products out there. There's a lot of different protocols that you can use for this, uh, but there are a number of common patterns. So. Um, you can have point-to-point -point messaging, where you're sending a message to only one single receiver, or you can do pub-sub, where you can subscribe to a topic, and then whenever a message is sent to a topic, 
every subscriptor will, will actually get a copy of it. You can say, I have a queue, but I have multiple applications listening to that, picking up messages to distribute workload, for example. That's called competing consumers. Um, and these patterns are now being supported by another a member of the Spring Cloud family called Spring Cloud Stream. Now, I don't actually have time to demo that anymore, uh, but there is code in my uh, demo code that I'll, uh, like I said, I'll put on Twitter in a, after the presentation that you can check out for yourself. Um, that supports these notions as in an abstraction where you don't have to actually configure the actual broker anymore. So you're not using JMS directly, or AMQP directly, or some Kafka client directly, or a Redis client directly. Um, you can actually say, I would just like to have a notion of uh, some, some topic that I can publish on, and something that I can listen to, and it will figure this out for you. It even supports some more fancy concepts. Partitioning, for example, means producer actually tags certain messages, and then they will always arrive with the same competing consumer. This is cool for things like sensor data, right? If I'm keeping track of a moving average of certain sensors, I really don't want my sensor information to end up with lots of different uh, listeners because they will not have the previous information. So you can actually tag it so it always reaches the same one. Or you can make sure that if a consumer goes away temporarily, it will still receive the messaging, right? So this is a fairly new addition, like I said, running out of time to, uh, to actually demo this, but just so you know that it's there. So this gave you, a, hopefully, a bit of a bit more insight into the main components of Spring Cloud, uh, namely the configuration stuff, the services registration, and the uh, synchronous uh, inv invocation through all of the uh, Netflix libraries. Uh, of course, there are many other things that come into play, right, when you're building a distributed application. Like, if something is really slow, what is actually making it slow? Um, Maybe uh, what if I have to do things like OAuth authentication, I need to actually propagate that info to backing services. Or uh, what if I want to know about other service instances of my service, and I want to know how many are there, like significant others. So there's, there's projects for that as well. So there's the SLU stuff, that's for distributed tracing. Um, there is something called Spring Cloud Bus that will actually allow you to propagate commands to services. Uh, there is a, a part uh, that integrates with security, in particular for OAuth. And there is something called Spring Cloud Cluster for coordination, right? So this is a big topic area. Obviously not something that you can cover in any depth in 45 minutes, but um, I encourage you to uh, check it out if you're interested. Um, also, uh, switching back to uh, track host mode here, um, please remember to, uh, to rate this session uh, uh, when you leave the room, or preferably before you leave the room. Um, I'm sorry that some of the things that I uh, planned uh, didn't quite work out, but it was a bit stressful here with all of the crashing and slowness here. Um, but uh, I hope you learned something. Um, I hope to see you all at the uh, last keynote of today, Simon Singh. I'm actually looking very much forward to that. If you have any questions left, do we have time now? There's, um, <coughs> there's time for questions. Okay. Well, in that there's case, uh, a few questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, and one, I think, is a short one. Uh, your first request earlier failed. Is it intended that every first request fails? No, no, that was uh, very much uh, some slowness, weirdness issue on my laptop that just recovered from a crash. Uh, that was not expected. What is the suggested fallback if the remote configuration isn't available when bootstrapping a service? Um, I would say it depends. Um, normally, the remote configuration should be available. Right? It should be a highly available component. So uh, normally, it will actually just prevent your service from starting. You can actually configure it to ignore uh, that remote service not being available, and then you can fall back on some local defaults. That is fully supported, but that's more intended for development purposes rather than for production purposes. So my recommendation would be if the highly available, you should make it highly available, configuration service is not there, that's actually reason enough to simply fail at startup. Config Server itself may actually cache certain things. If you're using something like Spring Cloud Config Server, which is backed by a Git repository, it does a clone of the remote Git repository. So the Git repository itself doesn't actually need to be highly available. It will use a copy. But for your service clients, I would just fail in production. Yep. I think that's it, looking at the time. So uh, thank you, uh, Joris. Okay. And thank you.